Islam has placed a very big obligation towards our neighbors. That obligation first starts by getting to know them. Many of us live in neighborhoods, streets, two, three, four, five years, sometimes ten years, and we don't even know our neighbors. The first step is go visit them, get to know them, see what their living standards are. If your neighbor is hungry or not, how will you know if you don't know them personally, if you don't know what their circumstances are? Go visit them, pay them a visit in their house, see, you know, sometimes in the house you get an idea of whether this person is struggling or not, you can tell. So the first step is to get to know your neighbors. This is an Islamic obligation. Now once you've visited your neighbors, if they're well off, alhamdulillah, that's great. Just keep good ties with them. Every once in a while, visit them, call them, give them a gift. Just be respectful. But if you realize that one of your neighbors is actually suffering from poverty, they don't have to be starving, but they're really poor, they're struggling. There's essential items they can't get, essential furniture. Maybe the quality of their food is not that good. You know, they can only buy the cheap junk food, but not the healthier food. Let's say that's the case. What is your obligation over here? I'll mention the following points to understand what our obligation is. The first point to keep in your mind, when you go and work and you make that income, let's say this year you worked and you made $100,000, let's say. The human being thinks that the $100,000 belongs to him. Who told you this belongs to you? You don't really own this. It's just money that God put in your hands. Your neighbor has a share in this money. It's not totally yours. Who told you it's yours? See, the one reason why it's hard for us to give is because in the first place you thought it was yours and you're giving it from yourself. It's not yours to begin with. When Allah gave you that $100,000, in reality God is saying, hey, here's 50 for you. The other 50 is for your neighbors, for other poor people, for other charitable projects. It was never mine in the first place. Allah sent the money of your neighbor through you. You're just a messenger. If you go to a company and they give you $20,000 and they tell you, take this and give it to your neighbor. We have a business deal. He was not able to come. You're a messenger. Take it. You know how the human thinks? Oh, I've got $20,000 and it's mine. Should I give it to the neighbor? Should I, got, should I take half of it? Should I give him? What, and what's, what ends up happening, most people just take all the 20000 to themselves. Or they might give the neighbor 1000 2000 To begin with, it was not yours. Your job was to take that money from point A and deliver it to point B. Brothers and sisters, the income you make is not yours. Who said it's yours? I know the society tells you it's yours. Capitalism tells you it's yours. But Islam says no. To begin with, it's not really yours. That's why when Allah mentions the money that we have in this world and all the belongings, Allah says, خَوَّلْنَاكُمْ Allah says when you die and you have to give back what we lent you. What we lent you, takhwil. If I give you $10,000 and I say this is not money in your hands, keep it for a year, I'll take it back from you. You never really owned it. So you have to look at money like that. It's a responsibility in my hands. God has told me to take it from point A to point B. Just like when you take that income and you believe that your daughter and your son has a share in it, right? When you have that $100,000, do you tell, oh, this is only on me to spend? No, it's for your wife and children as well. Well, put your neighbor with you. You have a bigger family, that's all. Islam teaches you with your neighbors, just you have a bigger size family. So that's the fundamental point to keep in your mind. Once you see it that way, it becomes easier to help them because you recognize your neighbor has a right in my income. It's not totally for me. Now, if you have extra cash that you really don't need, you just want to save up for the future, one human desire that we have is to accumulate wealth. Save up and save up and save up. Islam is against saving. 
Islam does not tell you be irresponsible, don't plan for your economic future. But don't save up that much. Islam discourages you from saving. In fact, Imam Ali السلام, every day he made it a point that the room which housed the Muslim treasury, which you know had the public funds, the Imam would make sure every night he wouldn't sleep until that room was empty. Now come and philosophize and tell me no, a government needs to have backup and reserves and you put me all these philosophical, economical expressions. Imam Ali teaches you otherwise. Until you're saving up for the future when there are people dying today. What have you achieved? You save to protect yourself. But when you save, you're denying the current generation. All these people in Canada and the US, they're saving millions for the future and every day 30,000 kids are dying. You think that's right? You're saving for a future, at what expense are you saving? If the whole world was uh, well off and nobody was starving, fine, save all you want. When there are people starving, until what are you saving for? Islam teaches you if there's a need out there, don't save for the future, what are you saving for? You're trying to secure your future at the expense of destroying your present. Which logical person does something like that? You know, imagine a person says, you know, I'll let me take this $1,000, put it in my bank account, and he's starving. And he goes out, out in the street, and he's dying. And you tell him, well, your money, go use it. No, I'm saving for the future. What would you say to a person like that? And he dies in front of you. Well, how would you describe a person like that? Fool, right? Such a person is a fool. Well, brothers and sisters, I know it's a strong word, but the reality is, a lot of people in the world are doing this every day. Every day 30,000 kids are dying from starvation and malnutrition. 30,000 every single day. 10 days, 300,000. 3 months, 3 million. 3 million. What's the population of Halifax? 300,000? 600? So if every day 30,000, that's 20 days. Every 20 days, the size of Halifax kids are dying. Why? We're saving up, save up, save, save. Islam discourages you from saving when there's a need. Don't talk to me about the economic future and security. Habibi, you talk about economic future and security when you fix the present, yes. Islam says start fixing your present, then worry about the future. We do the opposite. We try to fix the future, which we can't anyway. You fix the future, and then you're sacrificing the present. And Allah teaches you in this world, don't say, I'm Canadian, I'm American, I have no obligation towards the others. No. You're all living in one neighborhood. It's called planet Earth. And you all have an obligation. And when you think of neighborhoods, you know, your neighbor, don't, don't just think about your literal neighbor. Every human being on earth has a right in your money. They have a right in the income that you've made. So if you have some extra money on the side, give it to your neighbor. If your neighbor is in need, is, is poor, maybe the quality of their food life is not that good, give them from your money. Let's say you don't have money and your neighbor is starving or is very poor. But you have extra furniture that you really don't need. It's not really going to change your life if you sell that furniture. Let's say you have a fancy Persian rug. I know it's nice and your heart is attached to it, but you don't need it to survive, really. What is it going to do? Really, some piece of cloth and the threads is going to make the quality of your life better? If, if I have a type of life that I need threads to make me feel better, oh boy, I'm in trouble. That's a sad life. If I need threads to feel good about myself. Me, the human being who Allah says, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ I've honored the human being and I've given you the intellect. I need threads to have a good quality life. That's a pathetic life. 
I'm not saying you can't have these, it's okay, have them. But if you're so attached to them, you can't let go of them, that's a pathetic life, seriously. Because now you've made yourself in need of threads that you walk on, <laughs> right? That you step on. Where's your karama? Where's your honor? Where's your dignity? So if you have extra things like that, sell them and let this person live a better uh, physical life, eat better, be, if this person, for example, needs medicine, a lot, of, a lot of parts of the world, there are families suffering from sicknesses, they can't afford medication. Go buy medication from them. Allah expects that from you. So if you don't have extra cash, then, but you have items that you can sell that you really don't need, do that. Allah expects that from you. It depends on the need of your neighbor. If the neighbor is suffering, See, sometimes the neighbor has a 32-inch TV. He wants a 60-inch TV. It's, it's, if you buy them that, it's okay. You still get a reward by giving any gift. They do have a sofa set. They'd like a fancier one. It's okay. You can give, but it's not wajib. But if the person is suffering, they need medicine, they need food, they're suffering, it's wajib to give them. So whenever there's suffering, whenever your, your neighbor is suffering, then yes, it is wajib to give them. Yeah, if it's a luxury that they want, it's not wajib to give them. It's still mustahab, you still get a reward. If you go to your neighbor one day and say, you know what, I want to buy you brand new furniture. May Allah bless you for doing that, but you don't have to, it's not wajib. But if your neighbor is suffering, it is wajib, absolutely. It's an Islamic obligation, and the one who doesn't do that, Allah will take the barakah from your life or barakah from the life of your children and progeny. And remember that you're preparing for the hereafter, even if you gave so. You're building your hereafter. You know, tonight in the lecture we talked about the reward for fulfilling the need of someone in your society. Why miss out on all that reward? You get the reward of more than 9,000 years of ibadah. Brothers and sisters, these are not exaggerations. You and I, we exaggerate. Not the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, not the Prophet. Alf, alf, hasana. One million, one million hasana. The one who tries to fulfill a need of a fellow brother in society. One million hasana. That's mind boggling. That really is mind boggling. That's the way to build your akhirah. And if you ever struggle with this idea, just go back to my first point. The money is not yours to begin with. Allah gave you an amana. Allah says, hey, deliver this to 10 places. One place is your place. Nine is not yours. One place is yours. You have poor relatives, that's one place. You have a neighbor, that's one place. Orphans, that's a third place. Just remember, this wasn't yours to begin with. But when you believe that it's yours and you own it, then it becomes difficult to give it up. Whenever now, my dear brothers and sisters, you get your paycheck, before you pick up the paycheck, just remind yourself. Talqeen works, it does wonders. When you remind yourself of something, it does wonders. Just tell yourself, it's not mine. I'm just a, I'm just a mailman. Delivering this from one point to another point makes it a lot easier. Ooh.